Toronto-based Socialist Caucus and a past secretary of the Toronto New York Region Labour Council. We acknowledge that this event is taking place on Indigenous lands across Turtle Island, known as North America. That includes the unceded territories of the Mississaugas of the New Credit, the Wendat, and Audenoshani people in a place called Toronto. Today, I'm speaking to you from Jamaica, where the Indigenous Taino and Arawak-speaking people began arriving 4,000 years ago. They were wiped out by the European colonial powers. We join in the fight for justice, recognizing that there can be no real reconciliation without restitution. That entails seizing the assets of the big resources, corporations, and returning them to the commons. Now we present tonight's topic. Is nuclear power the answer? Featuring Angela Bischoff and Tom Baker. Our speakers will pre present their views for about 30 minutes each and then answer questions from the audience. So let's welcome our first speaker. Angela Bischoff is the director of the Ontario Clean Air Alliance. The OCAA was established in 1997. It successfully led the campaign to phase out the use of dirty coal power in Ontario. Presently, the OCAA is working to move the province of Ontario to a 100% renewable electric system. So welcome, Angela. Thank you, Elizabeth and Barry and all of you at Socialist Action and Kiri. I'll share my screen and I'm going to talk fast because I've got lots of... That's not it. Is that it? Sorry. Here we go. Do, do you see the full screen? Yes. Okay. So as Elizabeth stated, Ontario Clean Air Alliance, we're a small NGO, non-governmental organization, community organization, civil society. We were formed in 97 to call for Ontario's coal phase out. And many of you re will recall at that time, Ontario got a quarter of its electricity from coal power. It was very dirty. And at around the turn of the century, we would get about 50 smog days each summer. And, uh, you know, it was causing premature deaths. Doctors were speaking out. You would wake up in the morning and they would the news announcer would say, don't go outside today if you don't have to. It's a smog day. So environmentalists came together and started calling for the coal phase out. They were very strategic. They got polit they were very political. They got the opposition parties on side uh, calling for coal phase out. And the governing conservative government of the day it was an election year. They caved to all these opposition parties who were all in line with this uh, coal phase out campaign and the governing conservatives of the day uh, called for the coal phase out or announced it prior to the election. Then they lost the election. And then McGinty's government, the liberal government took over and made it happen. It took 14 years, but they made it happen. Once it was on track to being phased out, we turned our attention to moving Ontario to hundred percent renewable energy future. And that, that includes wind both on and offshore in Ontario. So we're talking only Ontario here. Wind on and offshore, solar energy efficiency, water power and storage imports from Quebec, stationary batteries and EV bidirectional batteries. And I'll talk about these throughout the presentation. But we're really here to talk about nuclear power. So the focus of my presentation is why would the Ontario Clean Air Alliance be against nuclear power, uh, which we are. Um, so just to give you the really big picture, we're to, you know we're all here watching this from all over Canada. Uh, Canada is you know has nineteen working nuclear reactors right now, 18 in Ontario and one in New Brunswick. We had a couple in Quebec, they were both shut down, um, largely due to political activism and opposition from the public. But really Ontario stands alone, you know, really stands out 
from the rest of the world. In fact, we're the second most nuclear, nuclearized jurisdiction in the world, second only to France. So, oh, I gotta get rid of that. All 19 nuclear reactors in Canada, they are can-do design. So this was a specific a Canadian design. It came out of the, um, essentially, the start of the nuclear industry in Canada. It started in the 40s when Canada, along with uh, Britain and the United States, agreed, you know, came to a pact that Canada would do, would produce uh, nuclear reactors essentially to produce plutonium because the waste product from the fissioning process is plutonium and that's what weapons are made of around the world. Not only plutonium, but a lot of plutonium. Um, and so Canada actually provided the United States weapons program plutonium until the late 60s, at which point then they started producing it themselves. Um, but in the process, we were researching nuclear fissioning and we came up with our own Canadian nuclear reactors. Essentially, they produce heat. The fission project process produces heat, which um, heats up water, uh, boils the water to produce steam, to turn a turbine, to create electricity. So it's a very expensive way to produce electricity or to boil, uh, to boil water, basically. All of the can-dos are cooled and moderated with heavy water. Uh, they use unenriched uranium. So uranium from Canada, most of Canada is the second largest exporter of uranium around the world for nuclear reactors all around the world. At this point, all the uranium mining happens in Northern Saskatchewan. All of the can-do reactors in Canada have been very expensive. In fact, they essentially bankrupted Ontario Hydro in the late 90s, left taxpayers with a $38 billion debt, which took us decades to pay off. They're all publicly owned. No surprise, all the, you know, the nuclear reactors for the most part in the world are publicly owned because, you know, the private sector won't touch it. They're too expensive, too risky. Um, and they all, all of Canada's tritium, or sorry, all of Canada's nuclear reactors are mega tritium factories. Tritium is an ex is used in nuclear weapons as an explosive enhancer. It is uh, um, it, it's a uh, carcinogen. It causes cancer. It's a teratogen and a mutagen. It mutates genes. Teratogen crosses the placental barrier, it's at ionizing radiation, very dangerous. And it's a real problem for the can-do uh, industry in Canada, where we're just storing it and trying to figure out what to do with it. Whoops. So most reactors in the world were built in the 70s and 80s. Um, and then, and as such, in the mid 90s, 17% of the world's electricity was produced by nuclear power. But, you know, after Chernobyl in 1986 and Fukushima in 2011, you know, its global share has really shrunk. So essentially, as many reactors are closing as are building, and such that today, uh, nuclear power contributes 9.2% of the global electricity share. So it's shrinking. And primarily because they can't compete with lower cost renewables. I mean, yes, after Chernobyl and Fukushima, the world got scared off from nuclear power. It also shot up the prices for nuclear power because everybody was concerned about security and, and safety concerns. Meanwhile, renewables are coming down year by year by year. And so nuclear can't compete. So countries are turning away from nuclear power when, they're, when their uh, reactors come to the end of their life, they're closing them rather than building and then building, replacing them with renewable power. Um, and yeah, so it's an aging fleet. The nuclear reactors, like I said, most of them were built in the 60s, 70s and 80s. And then the bankruptcies, you know, are scaring countries off. Arriva in France, Westinghouse in the United States, Ontario Hydro here 
in Ontario, they essentially all went bankrupt due to cost overruns, long delays in building up projects, and uh, those companies got scooped up by um, provincial taxpayers, or, you know, by government uh, buyouts. So Arriva it was taken over by Electricity du France, which is, you know, a state company. Um, and Ontario Hydro, of course, was was bought out by you and I, the taxpayers. I mentioned that um, there's more reactor startups than, than shutdowns. And so we're seeing a decline in nuclear power. And, and these are the, it's kind of an ugly uh, image, but this shows from 1960 to 2022, the blue lines are all the, the reactor startups and the yellow lines on the bottom are all the closures. So you can see there was lots of reactors built up until 1986, which was Chernobyl. And then boom, they 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 stopped. People, countries stopped buying reactors. You would see in 20, 2011, the big line going down, those were, you know, when Fukushima happened and there were lots of reactor shutdowns, including especially in, in um, Japan, and most of them are still closed today. So the industry likes to prone, promote itself as, you know, they're, they're in the midst of a nuclear renaissance, but we say it's actually a renaissance in reverse because, you know, the first renaissance that the industry hyped themselves as was in the 2000s where they, you know, the whole world was coming together after Kyoto in 1997 and climate was recognized globally as a big concern. Nuclear power was, you know, the stations were starting to shut down. So they re, they promoted themselves as a climate solution. But then Fukushima blew and again, countries went no way and lots of European countries just turned away from nuclear altogether. So then just in recent, four or five years, the nuclear industry is now re-promoting themselves uh, as a solution to climate by saying, we're gonna create smaller ones that are gonna be modular. So SMRs, small modular reactors. And they're promising that this is gonna save the day, but this is really just PR hype. And I'll, I'll explain- I'm Using more. thorium, not uranium. Nobody's using thorium. The SMRs are not using thorium. Those are those are. Excuse me, of... please do not anybody in the audience interrupt our panelists. Thank you. Go ahead, Angela. Angela. Yeah, and just to you know about the nuclear renaissance in reverse, uh, the International Atomic Energy Agency anticipates the closure of ten reactors per year from you know in in the coming years. So reactors are closing down. Very few are opening. Some are opening in Russia and China. And that's because those are big centralized governments that are taking on the expense and the risk and not giving the public any input into that conversation. At, and, and Ontario, Ontario, huge expenditures on nuclear. Meanwhile, renewables are are on the rise massively. So while nuclear suffered net loss last year, Renewables grew 50% from the previous year. So record growth, just literally exponential growth. And the International Energy Agency says that by 2028, 42% of power around the world will be coming from renewables, of which 25% is wind and solar. So when, you know, when skeptics say renewables are not going to solve our electricity supply issues. Well, they are, they're happening all around the world and it's just growing. This is an example of solar. So solar just, you know, from 2001 to 2023. So in the last 22 years, solar is just growing exponentially and it's expected to just keep going, growing. But to give you a sense how much power that is, the 440 gigawatts on the far right, Canada supplies around 160 gigawatts. So it took Canada, what, 100 years to build out coal or, you know, all our different electricity sources, mostly coal, water, wind, solar. Those are primarily gas. That's how we're pr produced. So 
all of that together in Canada, 160 gigawatts. And one year alone, the solar industry kicked up 440 gigawatts. That's three times Canada's entire, you know, 100 year rollout. So this is happening very, very quickly. And I would say that, that those 444 gigawatts are more than the entire existing capacity of the global nuclear fleet. So that's more than is produced by the glue. And this is just a one year, and this is just solar. So it's really moving fast. And it's the same thing with, with uh, wind power. It's just growing, it's taking off across the world. So in the midst of this huge renewables revolution in, around the world, and really a decline in nuclear uh, builds around the world, um, except for Rus Russia and China, Canada jumps back into the game. So, you know, we've always been part of the nuclear game. We were part of the nuclear game back in the 1940s with the United States and, and Britain. And so we still want to be part of the big boys club. And, and and also, you know, to be fair, we have like in, in Ontario alone, there's 10,000 nuclear workers that work at Bruce Power, for Bruce Power and OPG. They're all on the sunshine list, making over a hundred grand a year. So, you know, they're protecting their jobs. They're protecting their industry. Canada doesn't want it to shut down a whole industry. There'd be a huge backlash. All of those nuclear ridings are conservative ridings. So I don't know why Canada is jumping on the nuclear game. I just know they are. And the, the mantra that we hear is that there's no path to net zero without nuclear. And so while Canada is committed to tripling renewables and energy efficiency, et cetera, they're going bank gangbusters supporting new nuclear. So in 2017, it started in 2017 when we first heard about this, the feds gave the Canadian Nuclear Association a million dollars to map out their plan to revive the industry. 2018, they released the Canadian roadmap for SMRs and their strategy written in this roadmap was to convince Canadians that SMRs, small modular nuclear reactors are a climate solution. They urged federal and provincial governments to fund SMRs. They requested that SMRs be exempt from federal impact assessments. They requested that the, the feds agree to merge the waste streams because, of course, SMRs are very different waste stream than can do's because they're different technologies. And they requested that uh, the feds shield nuclear operators and suppliers from liability as is the case with can -dos. The feds gave them all those things. So they are now exempt from impact assessments. They're allowed to merge their weight, you know, all of those things. And so naturally the conservative uh, provincial governments of Alberta, Saskatchewan, Ontario, and New Brunswick, they all just got right in line and they signed memorandums of understanding to promote SMRs in their own provinces. Conservative governments, all four of them that don't wanna do anything about climate change, maybe even their climate deniers, and they want to continue burning their coal and their oil and their gas, and they don't really want to do anything because, except, you know, pretend they're doing something by saying, oh, we're going to build SMRs, which, you know, are a decade or two down the road. And in the meantime, they're going to continue burning their fossil fuels, which all those provinces are doing. So again, SMRs can't, or the new the nuclear industry can't survive without massive government subsidies. And that's the case across the board in every country that has built them. The private sector has completely failed and they demand public sector funding. And Justin Trudeau is, has gotten in line. So just in the last, I think this is the last two years, First, like this, you could just see all these different companies, Terrestrial, Moltax, Westinghouse, these are all different technologies. Like the, you're never going to get uh, economies of scale if you're building out all these different SMR technologies. So, you know, they claim to be modular. Well, they're, they're not going to be modular for decades if they put one here and one there. There's still research. All these projects are still 
We call them PowerPoint reactors. They've never been built. And the feds are just starting to throw money at them. And uh, the last bullet there is the feds, the Canadian Infrastructure Bank gave OPG $700 million low interest loan to OPG for the first of four SMRs that they want to build um, at Darlington, just east of Toronto. And these are essentially the first grid connected SMRs in the world. There's only, I think, four SMRs that have actually been built that are producing electricity at this point, two in China and two in Russia. I don't know if they're even grid connected. So that's why I said one of the first, but I wasn't sure. So SMRs, small modular nuclear reactor, they're not small. I mean, the SMRs that are proposed for Darlington east of Toronto are 300 megawatts each. Um, you know, the Pickering reactors are 500 megawatts. Like these are not small. They, they're, they're a couple of football fields large. They, they take up that much space. They're 11 stories high, another eight stories below the surface of, below the surface. Um, they're not modular. Like these are prototypes. If they're the opposite of modular <laughs> and they'll be, they'll not be modular for a long, long time, if ever, because you would have to build out hundreds or thousands to become modular. Solar panels are modular. Wind turbines are modular. You get economies of scale, you bring the price down, but uh, SMRs will never get there. Um, two years ago, 131 Canadian civil society organizations and indigenous communities signed a statement opposing government funding for SMR, claiming that small modular nuclear reactors are dirty, dangerous distractions from real climate action. dirty, dangerous distractions. So the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, this is the world's community of climate scientists that have been meeting for more than two decades uh, to produce research and reports to direct the world community through the United Nations to say, and they have recently, their most recent report says, we need to reduce emissions by almost half by 2030 to limit temperature rise to 1.5 degrees. So that, you know, we got six years to have our emissions. Um, we're, you know, nuclear reactors that are 10 to 15 years away, if ever, but let's say, you know, the industry is saying they're gonna have them up by 2029, but they don't even have the design. They haven't gotten approval for the design. Like these are huge mega projects, multi-billion dollar projects. Like, Nobody believes them. Um, meanwhile, wind and solar proven can be rolled out in one year. Um, so the, these nuclear reactors, and, and while they're building out these nuclear reactors, they're continuing to burn gas or coal or whatever, whatever their fossil fuel choice is. They're untested. They're PowerPoint reactors. They're not commercially viable. They're not even telling us how much they're going to cost because they're just, you know, the taxpayers paying for it. It's OPG. It's you and I. We own this company. There's no opportunity for public input. There's no long-term planning to to give us an opportunity to engage. They're not clean. What What is clean about radioactive pollution? They might not have greenhouse gas emissions when they are producing electricity. That doesn't mean they're clean, which is what they promote themselves as. There's nothing clean about the Fukushima or Chernobyl dead zones uh, where where they're, where scientists are finding animals and birds that are... Uh, that are maimed and genetically uh, deranged. And there's nothing clean about long lived radioactive waste, which the industry itself claims they need to figure out how to isolate from the environment for 1 million years. They have no solution. They're expensive. These SMRs, I mean, they're not even telling us how much they're going to cost, but we know that new nuclear is two to three times more expensive than nuclear or than renewables. And actually it's much more because we're, you know, we're dealing with long lived waste and decommissioning and those, I mean, we, we don't have any experience even decommissioning any can do's, let alone dealing with the waste. Proliferation, I mentioned that all, all these nuclear reactors produce plutonium and tritium and other, other uh, radioactive wastes 
that are a real proliferation concern. And now some of these SMRs that are being proposed uh, up in Chalk River, but also in New Brunswick, they actually want to uh, uh, reprocess the waste to pull out the plutonium. They claim that they can pull out the plutonium and then feed it back in. Uh, but this is like the dirtiest process in the world, all reprocessing um, sites around the world. They're the, essentially the dirtiest sites around the world, like Hanford in the United States. Um, and there's been no public conversation about it, no parliamentary discussion about opening up these potential proliferation concerns. I mean, Iran wanted to do that and the whole world was like, no, you can't do that. You can't reprocess waste. Um, because you make the radioactive elements then available to nefarious actors. I mentioned earlier that these nuclear reactors are exempt from federal environmental assessment laws. Like the community, the NGOs in New Brunswick asked the federal government to, to make this Moltex company in New Brunswick go through an environmental assessment process so that the public could engage and ask questions and bring in experts. And the Fed said, no, we don't need to, even though they're opening up these proliferation concerns. And the feds just turn to, they say, the CNSC, the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commissioner, Commission, you know, they're our public body that protects us. Well, actually, they're a captured regulator. The head of the CNSC today came from the Darlington New Build Program. The old CNSC had, it now works for an SMR company. So it's a revolving door. The only... Uh, American SMR project that has been happening in the States that actually got approval and was moving through the process. The only one, the most advanced prototype SMR and the only one licensed to construct in the US was abandoned last November after spending billions of dollars. And because the customers, the prices just kept going up and up and up and the customers, which were mostly the municipalities, they just one by one. And so the new scale project, which was supposed to be, you know, the poster child, just like bleak. now. So the United States isn't 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 even moving forward. There's some private things here and there. They're trying to get I'll funding. The feds have. Did someone say something to me? Uh, yes, uh, five minutes left. OK, thank you. OK, and in Ontario, the Ford government won't tell us how much they're going to cost. Like what, what the heck? Why would we be like, let, let's look at the costs. Here's the costs. We've done the costs. These, these are either what um, we're paying in Ontario, actually what we're paying or what what Ontario, what Ontario won't tell us they're gonna cost like the, the new reactors we get from Lazard, which is an American well-respected, the most respected financial advisory and investment firm. So these are all legitimate numbers. Nobody critiques the numbers. No conservatives say they're not true. Energy efficiency at the far left. Our cheapest way is to, to provide electricity is to reduce the demand. And water power, uh, five cents, solar plus storage, 10 cents, onshore wind, 10 cents. We're currently paying 10 cents for nuclear power, but OBG says that's gonna go up to 13 cents. And don't forget that's heavily, heavily subsidized. Um, offshore wind, if we were to put uh, wind in the Great Lakes, 14 cents versus new gas, fired peaker pants, 22 cents and new nuclear at uh, 24 cents. So Doug Ford's energy plan is to ramp up gas and nuclear. That's what he's all about. He's building 1500 megawatts of new polluting gas plants. He's ramping out up the output of our existing gas plants. So as he's building all these new nuclear reactors, which all told will be about $150 billion, no public conversation, no discussion in Queens Park. Um, at Darlington, they're going to rebuild four old reactors, build four new reactors. Pickering, they're going to rebuild four old reactors. Bruce, rebuilding all eight reactors. 
plus building four new reactors. Meanwhile, a modest investment in energy efficiency, modest investment in renewables, which we're happy about, which we've been pushing, which they finally caved in this year, agreed to build out some renewables. And this $6.5 billion per year subsidies the taxpayers, you and I, pay to electricity consumers to artificially reduce electricity rates in this province. That's because that goes back a long ways where we have been, like it's it's just an unfair market thing to say, we're going to build out new nuclear reactors. We've already built out lots that are really expensive, but we'll just subsidize your electricity price so you don't know that, you're, that actually the rest... The, the the really high costs are just being borne by taxpayers. Really unfair. Meanwhile, they're burning gas. So this is, you know, as they build out their new nuclear reactors, their goal from 27 to 2043 is to ramp up gas. In 2017, we only got 4% of our electricity from polluting gas, and they're ramping it up to a quarter of our electricity. Who benefits from all these plans? Big corporations, Enbridge, OPG, Bruce Power and Chemical, uranium mining. That's who the Doug Ford government right now is representing. These big, large corporations, rather than taxpayers, the environment, uh, renewable energy producers. This just gives you a map where they all are, Pickering, Darlington, Bruce, right beside Toronto. Pickering is 30 kilometers from downtown Toronto as the crow flies. 30 kilometers. So if there was an accident at Pickering, one of the world's oldest and largest nuclear stations, eight reactors, if there was an accident there, all of Toronto would be evacuated because look what happened at um, Fukushima. They evacuated up to 50 kilometers in the Northeast of you know where the wind was blowing. Like, and hundreds of thousands of people were evacuated, but they that was a rural location. Chernobyl was a rural location. Pickering and Darlington are in the GTA, the Greater Toronto Area. If there's an accident, like, whoa, Canada is going to pay the price. And we still have no solution what to do with the waste. After, after 60 years of nuclear operations, all the waste is still sitting on the site where it was produced. Industry's trying to bury it on site. Um, in situ, they're looking for a long-term uh, storage solution. They call it DGR, a deep geologic repository, 600 meters below the surface of the earth, where they're going to fill in and abandon forever all of Canada's 50,000 tons of high-level radioactive waste. It's And there's two sites being looked at, one in northwestern Ontario, one in western Ontario. First Nations are not going to support this. They're throwing tons millions of dollars at these communities to try to find a willing host to accept all of Canada's high-level waste from all around Canada to, 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 uh, to bury in a deep hole, abandon forever. And it's going to take, by their estimates, two truckloads a day. These are highly radioactive truckloads with helicopters and, and trucks and cops uh, following all around because they're so hazardous two truckloads a day for something like 50 years. That's how long it's going to take to deliver all this waste. We say keep the waste on site, wherever it is produced, keep it on site and uh, responsible stewardship until we figure out a way to manage it. So repackage it in above ground, attack resistant, reinforced concrete vault. So it's super safe. They're not safe right now. They're in um, conventional storage buildings. And so let's make it way safer for those communities. New renewables are the future. Canada is going down a radioactive rabbit hole. Sorry, I'm just going to finish right up here. So we're saying it's no more spending on nuclear and gas or coal or fossil fuels. Canada and the provinces should only support renewables moving forward and energy efficiency. And there's been all sorts of studies. This is just one, Mark Jacobson, who shows that Canada can be 100% renewably powered. Even in Ontario, for example, I want to go to this one. Whoops. Ah, 
Even in Ontario, we could meet 100% of our electricity needs just with wind turbines off the Great Lakes alone. This is a study that was done for the Ontario government. At COP, they, the world committed at COP, it was part of the global stock take. All 200 countries agreed that we need to triple the world's renewable electricity by 2030 in order to reduce our, our climate damaging emissions and double energy efficiency. Canada signed on to that. We are advocating a campaign to triple wind and solar in Ontario by 2035, in line with COP, to lower bills, phase out gas, create good jobs, uh, and reduce the need for more nukes. And there's a few websites here, cleanairlines.org slash triple. That is where you can send a letter to government saying, we want to triple wind and solar, not more nuclear and gas. And no GTA reactor.ca specifically addresses uh, the nuclear reactors in the GTA. It says no more nukes in the GTA. Oh, thank you for bearing with me as I sped my way through that. Oh, we can't hear you, Elizabeth. I'm I'm not muted either. Can you hear me now? Okay, good. Must have hit my button. Thank you, Angela. It was very informative. A little scary, but informative. Okay. Thank you so much. Now let's hear from our second speaker. Dr. Tom Baker is a retired veterinarian at epidemiologist with over 25 years experience in the public sector in food safety, animal health, and emergency management. He's a leading member of Socialist Action NDP Socialist Caucus and is president of the Amazon Center ONDP Riding Association. Welcome, Tom. Thank you. It's an honor to be able to share the stage with Angela this evening. Uh, uh, just to get it clear, I'm the novice, she's the expert, and <laughs> and one of the most well-known activists in this uh, area, and I'm really pleased to be uh, hear her presentation and have this discussion this evening. Um, in preparation for this uh, talk, I did have an opportunity, though, to review some of the recent literature and contributions around this issue of nuclear power as a potential tool uh, in fossil fuel-free strategy. And um, I'm not sort of, there's not a pro nuke presentation. Uh, it's just bringing some, some of the, many of the issues that, I'll, that have already been dealt with by Angela, but I wanna bring a few more points up. Um, I see this evening as having two purposes. One is to exchange information uh, about the existential crisis facing the planet. And secondly, to maybe start discussing strategies for building a movement which can eliminate fossil fuel capitalism. There'll be a question period and I'm hoping you can get it in. I mean, there's a lot of technical knowledge here, right? It's It makes your head spin. <laughs> I'm hoping we can also get into some broader discussion of you know, why are capitalists so committed to the fossil fuel uh, industry? And why are the politicians uh, subsidizing that? Um, the feasibility of various technical solutions in creating a fossil free energy supply. What type of social transformations are we looking at if we're gonna get out of this mess? Um, what would a socialist program to save the planet uh, look like? What are the root causes behind uh, this situation? Um, there's just a mugshot from the petrol kings that were at uh, COP28. Um, and they, um, with, with recent COP28 meeting, there was a call for certain fossil fuel reductions for the first time. You had to look really hard to find that, but apparently it's somewhat true. Uh, there was a lot more enthusiasm for tripling nuclear energy than there was for anything else. This, uh, I guess, see some business opportunities, what have you. Uh, um, but the, the political leaders and the fossil fuel folks that were at COP28 did not really commit to phasing out uh, gas, oil, and coal. They, um, the, in fact, the Secretary Simon Steele, he said, we did not turn the page on the fossil fuel era. The, on, the only use of phase 
uh, it apparently is in the, the stated objective. It says accelerating efforts toward the phase down, not the phase of, phase down of unabated coal power. So this is pretty narrow. <laughs> not all fossil fuels, just coal and not a phase out, but just a little bit of a uh, uh, phase down. Um, so not a single proposal at COP28 really moved moved us one inch closer to uh, meeting target reductions on fossil fuel use. The, the scientists you know, that surround these various UN meetings and advise them, they get muzzled, they get silenced. So a lot of the information they want to see in final reports doesn't show up. What the science scientific consensus is that no new net addition to current coal or gas plants can be built and that existing ones need to be closed down within a decade if we are to meet the target of staying below 1.5 um, degrees. So there's a critical need to transition away from fossil fuels. Um, there's ample evidence of the negative impact of the fossil fuel um, on our environment and its role as a main contributor to climate change. There are countless measures that can be taken to um, mitigate the impact of climate change and to decrease carbon emissions in the future, but it's important that we understand the root causes of the situation that we're in. The capitalists continue to reap super profits and enjoy massive public subsidies while the planet suffers the consequences. We've been burning fossil fuels at least 200 years um, on a, on a commercial scale. Uh, in fact, you could argue that that's really what powered the growth of industrial capitalism. Imperialism now has allowed the capitalists to, of course, externalize uh, much of marginalize uh, much of the negative impact of fossil fuels on the colonialized countries and indigenous people. The unlimited need of capital to expand has now exceeded nature's limits. And that's what's making this whole discussion so critical. Well, um, nuclear power, should it be part of this transition to, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions? Um, well, I, I think maybe it was mentioned, but about 10% of the world electricity supply does come from nuclear power. It's certainly not a, a major uh, source, except in Ontario. <laughs> As Angela mentioned, we're kind of um, loners. Uh, in that uh, situation where uh, I'll, I have the figures on this later, but it's a, a majority of our, our energy is, is coming from certainly from hydro and, um, and nuclear. When you look at this data and the information that's been presented this evening, I think we, it's important to realize there's a high level of uncertainty about a lot of that information on both wherever you are on, in the uh, spectrum of you know views on this. Um, it's really a minefield, and, and you really have to be careful what kind of margin of error uh, we're looking at. We know how the industry capitalists have greenwashed things, and they're very good at packaging information and trying to tell us what the data means. We have to be very, very careful and examine these things the best we can uh, on, on our own. Oops. So some of the factors when you're looking at the different technologies that are out there for uh, dealing with uh, climate change, in particular fossil fuels, and some of this has come up already, but certainly the construction costs, uh, the cost of ongoing operation after a power plant of whatever type is established, and of course the decommissioning. So the costs involved with all of those things. Um, the time to bring new energy on stream is a factor that's important. Uh, what are the relative risks of safety and human health? And I think we have to be a little bit careful on this uh, because uh, there is a lot of uh, human health dangers associated with uh, industry in general uh, and certainly with fossil fuels. And we, when we're looking at nuclear power and the potential, uh, you know, and real health concerns that are there, we have to careful uh, and, and, and look at it in relative risk in terms of what fossil fuel, for instance, uh, is, is doing. Um, the issue of waste um, or spent fuel in the case of the nuclear industry, there's waste associated, of course, with all the different uh, energy sources, but uh, the one with uh, nuclear is one that's certainly had a lot of attention. 
Um, how reliable is the energy and, and can it be stored? I, I would argue this is still an issue that we're going to have to do a lot more work on in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the, the non-renewable uh, solar and wind, for instance. Um, what is the projected energy demand? That's really hard to get information on. Well, I'll mention this later, but Ontario has not had any increase in energy demand for 18 years. So you kind of wonder, well, what, what's all the fuss about, folks? So uh, we got plenty of energy. Well, I, you have to project and look to see, you know, what what lies ahead. Uh, and I'll talk about this on another slide. Scalability, something can be great technology uh, on a small scale, but not be able to scale up to run a whole modern economy. And the issue of public or private ownership is quite interesting too. Um, and we'll, we'll touch on that, but uh, there is money to be made in some sectors more than others. And there's and with the nuclear industry, uh, I think the United States has shown that the private sector is not real interested in that. That's not a money maker. It's a bad investment uh, uh, for them. I want to look just a little bit at Canada's petro economy. Um, we are the highest, uh, one of the highest energy consumers per capita in the world, uh, five times the global average. And we also emit three times the global average of emissions. Canada has pledged to uh, reduce emissions to 40 to 45 percent below 2005 levels within this decade and it reached net zero by 2050. However, Canada's energy regulator has projected that the policy measures the government has in place right now would only result in reducing those emissions by 16 percent, um, lower than 2022 by uh, 2050. So federal government's talking about 100 percent clean power by 2035. They're not on the road to making any progress in that respect. They uh, they said they're going to shut, you know, uh, try to get the gas plants closed. Well, they've got so many loopholes there that Doug Ford's walked through. They're saying that, well, if uh, you can build them up till 2025, you can keep building gas plants. Um, oh, yeah. And you can continue operating them beyond 2035. So Ontario is using that loophole to ramp up natural gas right now. And uh, I assume they're hoping they can avoid cons conservation appeals and uh, and I guess rotating both blackouts. Canadian governments are heavily subsidizing the oil and gas companies to the tune of about 20 billion a year. Even in 2022, when they made record profits, they still got oodles of money. So for decades, the oil and gas companies have been misleading the public and governments about climate science and renewable energy. They promote false solutions like carbon capture and storage while expanding their production, destroying ecosystems and perpetuating injustice. Canada's reliant, heavy reliance on fossil fuels for domestic energy supply and export revenue only deepens this challenge. In, in 2022, 77.4% of the nation's end use energy demand was met with fossil fuels. So that's over three quarters of the end use energy demand was met with fossil fuels. Canada also exported 63% of its oil, 34% of its gas, and 67% of its coal production, shipping that out to, to help the world. While over 80% um, of Canada's electrical supply, electricity supply is emissions free due to hydro, nuclear, wind, and solar, electricity still only represents 17 0.6% of the end use energy demand. So we're producing a lot of electricity, um, but uh, it, it still represents a, a small amount of, of energy demand. There's an interesting report that just came out a couple of weeks ago that uh, you might find interesting. It um, comes out of the Canadian uh, Center for Policy Alternatives in British Columbia, David Hughes has authored quite an interesting report um, looking at uh, what he's primarily done is evaluated a study that the uh, um, CER, uh, the energy regulator, is projected for 2050 50. 
CR is saying we got to, of course, reduce oil and gas. We need a several fold increase in renewable generation, uh, a near tripling of nuclear capacity, and a many fold increase in carbon removal technologies. So uh, David Hughes ha ha goes through these and, and uh, evaluates uh, these. And, uh, first on industrial carbon re removal, he says these, these technologies are still very much in their infancy and they're not effective, nor are they scaled up. Um, so this is the, the carbon uh, capture, uh, utilization and storage, direct air capture. They're trying to make the case that they can clean the crap coming out of the power, uh, gas plants and, and the coal plants, uh, I guess, and um, all will be fine. And he's, he says that that uh, technology is a very high cost and very slow deployment. They talked about liquid hydrogen as being something that would have promise in the future. And he argues this is currently very high energy and emission intensive and has an inefficient conversion process. BC is looking at that right now, but I, I just heard the great so-called green hydrogen, but it's basically going to use up a big chunk of their hydroelectricity to, uh, to do that. So um, in terms of, in, he feels that, he, that the CER really underestimated the amount of elect, new electricity generation that's going to be needed. Right now, as I mentioned, it's only 17.6%. He says it needs to go up to 55% through increased renewables and other low carbon <clears throat> generation. And as it was mentioned before, conservation is key and there's really not as much discussion on that as there should be. Uh, we really need to reduce the demand. That's something we can do right now uh, within this decade. And if there's better, hopefully there's better technology coming along that we'll be able to, you know, click in by the next decade or, or even before. So as I mentioned, nuclear and hydro make up uh, together 79% of our Ontario's electric supply. Um, nuclear is 50, I'm not sure which year this is, I think it's 2023, but it could be 2022. Nuclear is 53.7% and hydro 25.9% in Ontario. Solar and wind around 12%. <clears throat> there have been issues raised and maybe we can get into this in discussion. I'd like to know what Angela has, uh, you know, what, what her thoughts are in this, but there's been quite a bit made of the question of um, stable supply of um, electricity is is solar and wind reliable enough in the Ontario you know <laughs> weather patterns uh, to be able to you know ensure um, uh, demand you know uh, is satisfied with, at, when needed uh, any time of the year. Um, electricity demand, as as I mentioned. Uh, is projected to increase with population growth. Uh, the government seems held bent on EV vehicles. Uh, that certainly will have an impact. Steel industry is moving to electric arc technology. That will have significant impact, certainly in places like Hamilton. And we're seeing more electric, uh, you know, heat pumps and so on. So it, it's not unreasonable to expect that electricity demand will go up, although it has been stable for a long time. As was mentioned, the nuclear fleet is going through a process of uh, refurbishing and, and construction of the first small modular reactor is, is underway. Um, the solar wind contracts, uh, in between 2009 and 16, as I understand, there was over 5,000 megawatts of solar wind power built up in Ontario. There's been none since Doug Ford's government came into power. Um, that was uh, something that uh, he was not interested in. Um, the, now, there's some interest, you know, that that hopefully is, is in the process of changing now. Um, government interference is a real issue in this whole question, in my mind. We see this in Alberta and uh, all the provinces, obviously. They don't want to be kicked out of office for high uh, electricity rates. Uh, so they seem to be willing to do anything uh, to, to keep rates down, uh, even if it means jeopardizing the planet's health. And um, I think that, that uh, the independent regulators, so-called independent, that were set up over the years seem to be uh, really have no power whatsoever now. And they, they, regardless of what they rule, the politicians seem to e easily turn that over. The just recent case with Enbridge, some of you may have read about in Ontario. Um, 
The international picture, I think this was touched on. China is uh, certainly the lead on renewable power generation from solar and wind power. And the investments they've made are, have really uh, been critical in bringing down the cost of this technology for the whole world. Um, they uh, are now cost competitive uh, with fossil fuels and, and even without financial support. And um, China has put the world on track uh, with, uh, you know, for to they've they've there's been a two and a half fold increase in renewables primarily as a result of the work china's done uh just below the threefold increase that was agreed to at, at cop 28. some uh european countries such as germany have proceeded to close all their nuclear plants over the last several years and uh, and rely on imported fossil fuels and and renewables uh, and most recently, since the gas line got blown up, uh, they're relying, they've opened up the old coal mines. Um, and this is is of grave concern. So the nuclear plants have been decommissioned. Now we have a situation where fossil fuel consumption is, is soaring. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I mentioned about nuclear power providing 10% of the world's electricity. Uh, but we are looking at increased energy demands, and it's doubtful that nuclear power can uh, would be able to satisfy that. Certainly not in any timely, co uh, cost you know, affordable way. Um, there is more increase interest in the nuclear technology now. I think we do need to reopen some of the things that we uh, have understood in the past and re-examine them. Uh, in particular with SMRs, I agree with what Angela said, but there's certainly a lot of hype. Uh, going on about those now. Um, concerns about nuclear power, I think Angela probably covered most of this here. Um, there's been a lot of fear about nuclear for very different reasons, I guess, over the years. I mean, at first, I think it was the, you know, the association with, with uh, nuclear bombs, uh, proliferation of weapons, uh, the question of cost and whether indeed it's necessary or even uh, politically feasible. But certainly the public fear uh, is, is, is significant. I think may perhaps not all of it is justified. And I think we do need to update our, uh, our data and look at what has the, what's the real world showing, uh, not just theoretical, but what are, you know, can we do better work on, on risk assessments uh, on, on this? Um, on the radioactive, radioactivity concerns. I, I'm hesitant to even go in here because I don't understand the technology and I'm, I'm not going to make a, a strong argument here, but I have read that, um, that the, in fact, uh, the radiation uh, exposure that people have who live close to nuclear plants is less than those that live close to coal plants. Uh, my understanding is that coal has a certain type of radiation uh, as well. And uh, definitely, when you look at a global level about the number of deaths attributed to fossil fuels versus nuclear power, you know, it, it it's clear that fossil fuels are are, are the, the main uh, concern. Uh, we can actually count those deaths, and they are in the millions every year. One in five deaths globally has been attributed to fossil fuel uh, burning. Um, the waste we, we've talked about that uh supposedly there's technologies being looked at and whatever but i certainly agree with, with angela that in the meantime it should stay where it is rather than trucking around um the yeah the cost of building a nuclear plant is you know takes at least 10 years although some of them now apparently have been built in seven but you're looking about nine or ten billion dollars uh, you know, just for the construction and, and the insurance licensing and all that. Um, once it's built, it's pretty inexpensive to run, uh, but the lifetime is limited to, you know, what are they talking about? 30 years, I guess, is, is probably the most you can expect before you have to refurbish. Um, yeah. yeah, the land use, someone said, well, it only takes up a square mile um, for a nuclear plant. Uh, it's, it's funny. Well, funny is not the word. Daniel Smith is making a big deal out of this now in Alberta around the uh, solar and wind farms. She doesn't like the look of a turbine in, in a field and, you know, and this kind of nonsense is sort of the aesthetics. And I believe that came up when we uh, when when the when Ford shut down, you know, wind farms or didn't allow any renewals of contracts. There's just this aesthetic thing. They don't like the look, you know, and 
I don't think that carries too much weight. Um, summary. Um, the UN scientific consensus is that the possibilities for scale up diffusion and global spread of carbon capture and storage, nuclear energy and carbon removal technologies has not progressed as rapidly as other alternative energy technologies. And I think that's what we're hearing tonight. Uh, and are not likely to play a major role in climate change mitigation. Um, which really at this point is going to have to rely on social change, demand side, low energy uh, solutions. So all the tech, all the energy sources have risks associated with them. And some of them are quite different uh, and unique to particular energy sources. Um, there's a you know range of perspectives on, on the, what we should do about existing nuclear or the po or, or possibility of, of building it up. But five um, the, the so oops. Uh, five minutes. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll get there. Um, but, but, but I guess we have to look at relative risk compared to, you know, the carbon emissions and the future of the, the planet. And that's, I guess, part of what I'm trying to get across. Shutting down nuclear plants that exist right now, I believe my limited understanding would be counterproductive um, to, in respect to uh, climate goals. Um, and I don't think anyone is necessarily suggesting that. Um, I think many people are saying, well, if they're running now and if they can be continue to be safe, and we certainly need more transparency on, on what's going on in those plants, um, that they can make a contribution. And if we, um, you know, the downside, and this is what happened in many jurisdictions, when as they shut down the nuclear plants, they, they increase the burning of fossil fuels. Um, we got some, some data on that. Um, yeah, from six, 1960 to 2009, each unit of electricity not generated by fossil fuels displaced less than one tenth of a unit of electricity generated from fossil fuels. So suppressing the use of fossil fuels will require changes other than simply technical ones, uh, such as expanding non-fossil fuel production. Um, so it seems that some countries that have, are building up the nuclear are also building up their fossil fuel. So they're seeing building up nuclear and then exporting their fossil fuel as revenue, uh, which kind of say the least is, is, is counterproductive. So nothing is a, as it seems. Uh, um, given the uncertainty about nuclear power and other low carbon technologies, um, um, where the thought is that it will continue to evolve and, and uh, if, if the deep cuts in emissions are going to happen, we can't dismiss any technology that could make a contribution, um, even if it's not a long-term uh, solution. And just one more slide, and I'll get off here. Um, Capital-based economies require growth, continued growth, which in, in has now exceeded nature's boundaries. Um, None of this alters the essential, this essential fact. Production takes place with the primary aim of capital accumulation. Consequently, new renewable energy capacity is put in service of that goal, not helping the health of the planet. Profit is the bottom line. Environmental concerns are cast aside. Time's running out uh, for the world to carry out the trans social transformations that are necessary to avert irreversible climate catastrophe, but achieving this will require revolutionary scale transformation in global social relations, affecting human relation to the climate and planetary environment as a whole. As socialists, we cannot magic away these problems, wish them away. We could bury our hands and heads in the sand and raise demands uh, that no one takes seriously, but better, the approach is to develop some science-based transitional demands and socialist answers to the problems we face right now. The major one being how do we put forward a program to massively reduce carbon dioxide emissions on a world scale to prevent global warming? Thanks. Okay, thank you, Tom.
Very interesting. Okay, so now we're going to go uh, to uh, for the Q&A. And I've asked people to either put them in the chat or to raise their virtual hands, which I see people are doing. It's great. And then I can go to the chat, eat it. And so for our panelists, I'm going to ask uh, three questions. And then I will go back to the panel and give them five minutes to answer either one, two, or three uh, of the questions each. And we will start, when I have the questions, we will start with Tom, and then we will go to Angela. Excuse so me, I'm going I to- I don't have a chat function. Can I please ask a question? Yes, you can. You raise your hand and I will come to you, Betty. I don't okay. have a hand to raise. I'm on an Android. Okay, well, I, I got some hands up now, but I will definitely come to you, okay? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so my first question will be from Flo, then I will go to Anz, and then I will go to Barry. Flo? Okay, hi, thanks everyone. Um, So I have, I guess, a bit of a rambly kind of question, or it's not super pointed, but uh, something I'd like to discuss a bit further or get your thoughts on. And it's just, I guess I'm struggling to kind of understand the dynamic or the incentives between like the government and industry, like in this particular situation. I came in a, a few minutes late, um, so maybe I missed something at the start, but it is tied into this, um, you know, I, I think the question about the strategy of p pivoting towards the SMRs from the can-dos, like I, I get, uh, thank you for responding in the chat there, Angela, that it's... Uh, supposed to be a cost-saving measure um it seems like whatever way you slice it it's going to be a funding transfer to private capital right like even if it's public funding they're just going to hire a bunch of private contractors and there you go um so i guess i'm struggling to what was the initial impetus of the government to push this um strategy or to keep nuclear being a thing i find it you know hard to believe that it's straight uh environmental principles and really caring the, about you know reducing carbon emissions typically there's already some kind of like donor capital base incentive that is directing government <laughs> initiatives uh and it, so i suspect <laughs> there's some kind of circular dynamic going on um and i would just like to explore that more and get your thoughts on it Thank you, Flo. I will go to Anz, and I forgot to say at the beginning that each participant will have two minutes to ask your question. Okay, Anz, you're next. My goodness, you're inviting me for two minutes. First of all, I am <laughs> uh, immensely grateful to uh, the two panelists, uh, and uh, I wish we, and we will put this on YouTube so we can get a wider hearing for it. Um, Angela, especially, uh, I'm from an engineering background, and I want to give you an honorary engineering degree. <laughs> um, at any rate, um, I could go on about my experiences with fail-safe computing and, as it pertains to uh, one offshoot in the Darlington uh, situation, but I will spare you that. Uh, and I'll throw a spanner in the works, and that spanner is called hydrogen, uh, which hasn't been addressed. Um, Canada, very early on with Ballard uh, Technologies, got into the field of fuel cells. And we have a couple of uh, viable industrial applications in uh, transportation in that field. Uh, but one discovery in the middle of last year that also pertains to Ontario is what they call golden hydrogen, uh, geological hydrogen deposits uh, as a gas that is not going to produce a greenhouse emissions if it is uh, indeed a viable alternative. Now, the oil industry, when it has encountered hydrogen deposits in its drilling, has generally dismissed them and has never investigated them further. 
but especially in soils such as our clay deposits, which are ample in the Great Lakes region, uh, there is supposedly a treasure trove to be explored of real clean hydrogen. And that is uh, an energy source that uh, I would like the two commentators, I'd like uh, comments from the two panelists, please. Thank you, Hans. Is that two minutes? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wish you had give you more, but we've only got, this is only a 90 minute program. Okay, Barry. I want to echo what the, the previous questioner just said in expressing my gratitude to the two presenters. What a high quality of investigation and reflection on the topic. Uh, it, it, it's just wonderful. And thank you. Thank you very, very much. I, um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that there was a certain stress on the issue of, uh, you know, publicly owned or privately built. And we know that the developers, Doug Ford's buddies in Ontario in particular, who want expansive housing developments uh, um, are, are part of very much a part of that motivation. But I'm going to ask, I'm going to try to slip in two questions. I think they're related. One is about degrowth. Um, when we talk about degrowth, we're not talking about the immiseration of the world, you know, population or even the population in the most developed countries, but the degrowth of wasteful production, production of commodities purely, purely for the purpose of generating profit. And what do I have in mind? Weapons, cars, commercial advertising, luxury homes, disposable clothing, unnecessary packaging. It goes on and on. Um, in order to save energy expenditure by uh, reducing and eliminating that kind of commodity production, you have to eliminate the commodity system, which, which, which brings me to uh, the mass movement um, uh, uh, call. Uh, Tom emphasized this. I think we all agree, Angela and all of us agree, that we need to build a mass movement. The question is, how do you build a mass movement? We, we can see the response to the genocide in Palestine, how a focus on one particular kind of horror has generated a world response, and it continues to grow. But to build a mass movement against the fossil fuel energy generation, can we afford to be ambiguous on nuclear generation and say, well, it might be part of the answer, maybe not. Um, I, I don't know that that's part of the equation of building a mass movement. Uh, it really goes to the issue for us as socialists is who's in control, capital or labor? Is production for people or for profit? And that can be resolved only by transferring power from the minority to the majority, the fight for a worker's government. But what will the slogan of the forces striving for uh, a new social system and, an, and a government by the majority, what will their slogan be? Will it be nuclear maybe or no, no nuclear, renewables only? Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Okay, so we're going to go back to the panel now. You have up to six minutes each, uh, if needed, to answer one or all questions. So we'll start with Tom. I'd like to make a comment, if I could, Excuse please. Excuse you could, Betty. But please, comrade, I've told you that I have a speaker's list here, and you're on it, and I will get to you. Okay? Okay, thank you. As thank as you. As you. Okay. All right. So, uh, Tom, you're on. Your music, Tom. Okay. Um, well, those are pretty heavy questions. Uh, first on... Um, One chair is enough, Barry. On uh, dynamic between government and industry, I think that's very interesting. And it kind of depends <laughs> uh, which government's in power and who you're talking to at, at a time. Uh, I heard this conservative apologist the other day. I'm not good on names, but he was on some kind of podcast and he was talking about how the conservatives have always been committed to public um, power, that this is something that, uh, that is part of the public infrastructure and rate payers shouldn't be stuck with uh, having to satisfy the profit needs of, uh, of the private sector. I was astounded. Um, and he said that the liberals gas and... Um, Sorry, the Liberals' solar and wind initiative was just to get their, you know, allow their friends to, uh, uh, like Enbridge and the folks that own the wind farms, to get rich. 
Uh, the first thing this Concertos did was to cancel all and they're going back to the public. So it's kind of interesting. <laughs> I don't so, I think it's a bit colored the way they looked at it, but there is a connection and, and I'd be interested in understanding that more um, as well. It seems like the governments are committed to cheap energy, uh, but also making sure their friends can make uh, exceptional profits. I think that's fair enough to say. I, Hans, I, I don't feel qualified to even touch. I mentioned that BC is looking at a green hydrogen. I don't even know where hydrogen comes from, but I'm told to make green hydrogen, you got to have a heavy power use to uh, break, to, to release the hydrogen, and then it has to be combined with ammonia, uh, which is dangerous, and then it's shipped you know, abroad. Um, don't know anything more than that. <laughs> uh, and maybe I don't know that. Um, and uh, Barry, um, on the, um, I guess what I'm sort of wondering about, I just throw it out. Uh, it's not an idea I've discussed, you know, officially with anyone. But I'm thinking, is there a basis for unity on uh, eradication of fossil fuels as a transition step towards, uh, you know, um, non-carbon uh, planet, non-carbon emission? Plan. I, I don't know what you think of that, uh, Angela. I just that's kind of where my stat research was taking me to, and I, I just haven't had a chance to really kind of think that through. Okay, Angela, six minutes. Good questions. Um, regarding the public funding, like we as socialists as progressives we want to support you know public health care public institutions but the public institution of opg has not been doing us favors uh they are a gas and nuclear company and you know the, alberta has been building so much renewable power that's private that's private industry and doug Ford, when he was elected, he kicked all those renewables industries out of the province and they went to Alberta and other provinces. And now Quebec is going gung ho with building out wind turbines. They just announced today uh, eight new huge wind projects. And so, you know, we lost out on all those jobs and the low cost power. So, you know, our public institution of OPG, they're not interested, as you just suggested, Tom, in low cost power. That's what they got elected to do, but they are going full speed ahead with the gas, peaker plants and nuclear, the two most important expensive options. So then to answer, I think it was Flo's question, why would they be doing that? And, you know, they're like, they're protecting their certain corporate interests, but, you know, and their their conservative ridings and the status quo. Like it would be a big thing to start shutting down nuclear reactors. Now, Germany did that. It would be interesting to know what the public private thing is there, but they have a huge history of uh, community power. And in fact, half the renewable power in that country is community power. And I think about half the power of the country is now renewables. So they just have like a huge public involvement in electricity production, which we don't have here. We've been cut completely out of, out of the picture. We don't even have environmental assessments. We don't have the opportunity to engage in the legislature because there's a majority government there that hates renewables and canceled 758 renewable energy projects when they got elected and actually got elected on a commitment to kill renewables and now they're going for nuclear and gas because that was their commitment to the electorate when they were elected that they were going to kill renewables. So what's the alternative? You know, we don't want to be damming more rivers. We've already maxed out that. We don't want to buy I mean, we are advocating for more Quebec water power and storage imports. Uh but uh, Doug Ford has refused their their offers. The first thing Premier Legault did after Doug Ford was elected was come over. You know, another conservative government tried to sell us power. Doug Ford said no. Just this past year, he made a he canceled an existing deal that Kathleen Wynne had made for peak power from Quebec and made another one. So you know, there's little inroads being made. Um, 
So yeah, public power, I don't know. Private power, Texas is going full steam ahead with renewables. Their power is much lower cost and uh, they're, they're profiting off of, you know, renewables companies are profiting. Um, storage, I wanted to address that when someone's asked about are renewables sta stable? Maybe that was in the Q&A thing. Um, but they're stable if if we have storage and we have all sorts of storage options. So the provincial government has just spent many billions of dollars committing to building some large battery storage facilities. And that's good. It's also very, very expensive. Our lowest cost opportunities for storage to back up Ontario's intermittent wind and solar power is Quebec hydro reservoirs. There's an MIT study on it. Everybody knows that Quebec's hydro reservoirs can act as storage to Ontario's intermittent wind and solar. So we're exchanging uh, electrons between the provinces. When we have surplus, we give to them. When they And when we are underperforming, we take power from them. Very low cost. We're talking five cents a kilowatt hour. That's a fifth the price of new nuclear and, and gas. Um, but also EV batteries, which I didn't have a slide on. By 2030, the amount of EVs in this province is going to be twice the capacity, the EV batteries, the opportunity to store power is twice the capacity of Ontario's gas power. So we produce power from our gas plants instead of ramping up our gas peaker plants in the summertime or on uh, during high peak hours instead of ramping up our peaker plants. We plug our EVs back into the grid and we put power back into the grid during peak hours and then EVs charge up at night when, when uh, it's off peak hours, when nobody's using the power, that's when you plug, you, you go to bed, you plug in your EV, you drive to work the next day, you plug your EV back in the grid and the grid sucks your energy out. It, it makes... It, it, it makes your, like the EV owner actually profits from that electricity exchange and EV bi-directional batteries at, um, already exist and some EVs sell bi-directional batteries. We need to ramp up the whole infrastructure for actually um, selling power back into the grid. Um, and how to build a mass movement. I think you're right, Tom. The It's got to start with climate change and commitments to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And that means phasing out fossil fuels. And it also means doing the lowest cost, fastest ways to uh, electrify our economy, our transportation, our home heating uh, with heat pumps um, and energy conservation to reduce demand. And then we can meet those Electricity needs the fastest and cheapest way, and that's renewable power, and not wasting any more time on fossil infrastructure or nuclear infrastructure, just full steam ahead. And so many climate 30 seconds. Groups, okay. So many climate groups don't even talk about nuclear because if we can get wind and solar onto the grid fast, the, the faster we do that, the faster the prices come down, and the less likely we're going to spend decades and waste billions of dollars on new nukes. Okay, thank you very much. So we're going to have time for uh, one more uh, round of questioning, and I th think we will do four. And Gary is up next, and then it's uh, Betty Jane, and then it's Judy, and I have a question uh, from the chat. So we'll do that, and I think it gives uh, our panelists after that a couple of minutes each to wrap up, and our time will be over. Gary. You're muted. You're muted. Okay, okay Gary. I got it. Okay. Yeah. Um, somebody asked earlier about the power of the oil industry. The oil industry, quite simply, is the largest industry in the world and uh, has been around for about 150 years. Um, it is uh, inc incredibly connected. Almost all the wars are over oil. Uh, so it has uh, the, inter the uh, interpenetration of of oil executives and uh, and uh, capitalist governments, represented perhaps most visibly by Tillerman being the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Secretary of Foreign Affairs for the United States government, and then sliding easily back into Standard Oil, um, is a good example. But that happens all over. So it is totally. It's part of. We we like to refer to capitalism as 
as uh, petrocapitalism, uh, because oil is totally part of the capitalist system. It's drenched in, uh, drenched in the fiber uh, or one of uh, fossil fuels. So it's 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 going to take it's going to take the the uh, in my opinion will dramatically should be able to dramatically reduce fossil fuels, but the real elimination of fossil fuels is going to mean going past capitalism. Um, the other thing is that uh, is that uh, state-run operations, unless they're purposely misdirected for profit, and you know captured regulatory bodies are working to enhance the profit of their friends just outside. These are the companies they're gonna to go to after they leave regulatory boards. Um, and so they're functioning almost completely for capitalist interests. Um, and, and that's what we have to eliminate. We have to democratize decisions about oil, which means not only does all, do all, uh, should all uh, fossil, no, all uh, post-fossil fuel sources be publicly owned, but they should be, we should have demand uh, workers control, community control, and get out of these secret boards with the very rich participants and the, those others that are well connected to the rich. That has to cease. So we have to look carefully at at demands that democratize decisions and put it put it in the hands of working people. Um, uh, that's one a third. And that's my third point is. There has to be a fair and just transition, and nobody's talked about that. But if you got four hundred thousand people in the oil industry in Canada, uh, you got to think a lot about how you're going to handle those workers, and how we're going to meet their very their very legitimate uh, demand not to be uh, impoverished, simply thrown out on the turf. So we have to think carefully about that as well. So there's a big role to play here for unions, communities. And uh, and community-based organizations such as climate, the climate movement, um, to take a look at a different way of doing business in Canada. Um, so I'll just leave it there. I'm not really asking a question. I was just kind of commenting on some of these as aspects. Okay. Thank you, Gary. Betty Jane. Betty Jane, are you there? Okay, I'm going to move to Judy and come back to Betty Jane. Judy? And yeah, how do how do the uh, big businesses justify nuclear power when it's so dangerous? Okay, thank you, Judy. Uh, Betty Jane, are you there? Okay, so the question in the chat comes from our uh, Kiri, our our uh, technical producer. How realistic is secure evacuation plan for Toronto, and what are the consequences in dollars? So these are the questions. You have uh, five minutes, and I will start with Angela. Five minutes each, that is, Angela, and then go to Tom. And then I will come back for the last question from Betty Jane to see if she's returned. Okay, thank Angela. you. Yep, thank you. Okay, fair and just transition. So what we say, is, so A, we're not saying close this, the nuclear stations tomorrow. We're saying no new projects, no new rebuilds, no new SMRs. But they're all older. They're all coming to the end of their lives. So when they come to the end of their lives, instead of continuing to extend them, shut them down. And there will be decades of work for those nuclear workers because we need to decommission the plants. We don't know how to do it. It's going to take decades. It's cost billions of dollars. We need to deal with the waste, which we know is many, like even the industry says, it's going to take them five decades, I think, to transport the stuff before it's even buried and, and everything. So that's many decades worth of work. So that's what we're saying. Transition those workers to decommissioning and waste. Um, danger. Yeah. The industry justify Judy, the industry justifies their uh, industry uh, by saying, by denying that it's dangerous, by denying that there were tens of thousands of 
people affected at Fukushima and at Chernobyl and that got thyroid cancers and that suicided because they lost everything because they were evacuated and could never come back and um, or d denying that the animals are being uh, are mutating and that nuclear waste is an issue. They continue to say, hey, if you go onto any YouTube forum or anywhere, you're going to see comments on this video by NUCAD saying, oh, waste isn't an issue. It's only a Coke can size and it's bananas are more dangerous and which is so much BS that uh, that's how they get away with it. And also they get, they, um, get away with it because um, they don't have to pay the, well, this is a little bit different issue, uh, Judy, but it, it's relevant, I think. Um, we taxpayers actually, um, if there is ever an accident, taxpayers pay it because uh, Nuclear Liability and Compensation Act only makes the nuclear industry responsible for up to a billion dollars of, of uh, um, costs associated with the nuclear accident. So, for example, we think that the Fukushima accident is going to cost the Japanese economy half a trillion dollars. Well, if that were to happen here, well, the industry gets to walk away after just paying a billion dollars. They they get insurance only for a billion dollars. So, um, and that leads into the question about evacuations from Curie. So we hired a radiation biologist in the UK named Ian Fairley to do a report for us. Um, I I did pull pull it up here. Um, oh darn. I lost it now. Ah, now I can't get back into the Zoom. Um, I, a few years ago, about what would happen if we had to evacuate Pickering, and it, you know, there was there was one hundred and fifty thousand homes that would that would they'd never be able to return for like ten years or something. I mean, he compared what an accident at Pickering it, it, and Fukushima. If if the Fukushima style accident happened at Pickering, what would happen? He's he he thought he um came up with numbers like 150 uh oh darn i can't remember anymore it's been a few years 150 billion dollars in um loss yeah sorry i'm blowing up but maybe i'll i'll uh put it in the comments after in the video online i'll i'll show a link to the report, I don't know of other groups that have done similar reports, but we did this report, what would an evacuation look like around the Pickering Nuclear Station. But the fact is, there are 2.2 million people that live within 30 kilometers of the Pickering Nuclear Station. And if there was an accident, you know, like the highways and like, hmm. how would you, how would two million people where would they go and the loss of their homes and you know all Canadian taxpayers would be supporting them or not because the nuclear industry wouldn't have to because they're only liable for a billion dollars like it's and you know the industry will say it'll never happen here but why won't it I mean the Japanese industry is the most high tech on the planet and of course they said it would never happen there. And reports that came out after the Fukushima accident said the reason it happened is because of essentially collusion between industry and the regulator. That's what the, the reasoning was given. And we have a say, we have a captured regulator here as well. So accidents happen. There's there's been lots of um troubles with the Pickering nuclear station. The older a station nuclear station gets, the more dangerous it becomes because everything becomes embrittled from the fusion uh, process. And, uh, you know, we're playing with fire here. They would never get permission to build a nuclear station today in the middle of 2.2 million people. And it's only there because it was built prior to a huge population growing around it. And that population moved there thinking it was only going to be, the station was only going to be there for 30 years. It's now 52 years old. They got permission to run it for another couple of years. And now they're planning on rebuilding and extending the life. Currently, the waste on site, of the because there's eight reactors, it's huge. It came online, I think, in 69. And 
two of the reactors have since shut down, or four reactors were shut down for, for safety issues. Two were rebuilt and the other two never were. But there's all the waste from those eight reactors is on site. There's as much plutonium in that waste as all the nuclear weapons on the planet today. Like there's a lot of waste there. And, you know, that's a lot of kaboom power. And, um, you know, it shouldn't be in the middle of 2.2 million people or actually 4 million people because the GTA, you know, evacuations, like I said, happen up to 50 kilometers outside of Fukushima. Um, thank you. Okay, thank you, Angela. Tom? Yeah, um, just to supplement a little bit what Angela was saying about the uh, Chernobyl and Fukushima. Um, so, I mean, we 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 do hear this uh, pushback from on the promoters of nuclear power, and there's shred of truth as usual <laughs> in what they say. Um, I mean, there is. We have to remember there's two aspects to risk. There's the, you know the probability of something happening, and then the impact if it does happen. It does seem to be some consensus that the probability of a <laughs> nuclear accident is reasonably low, if not very low, given they've only had really two incidents in, what, four or five decades. Um, and But the impact, especially if you build a plant on a nuclear, on a, on a, a fault line, <laughs> um, is, is, you know, the impact could be unbelievable. I mean, the, the Fukushima thing was badly handled, I'm told, like they, uh, I mean, the, the private sector that owned it dropped the ball. They didn't have the safeguards in place. They, the, the, the government had everybody evacuating and it wasn't, in hindsight, they feel that was wrong, incorrect advice that it would have been better if people had stayed in place. Uh, there would have been less exposure. I don't know. I'm not, not the engineer. I wasn't there. Um, but they said that actually increased the exposure uh, when people were running around, you know, trying to get out of the area and so on. Um, so a lot, the, the problem is, is the secrecy and so on. I used to, in my former life working for the Ontario government, one of my jobs was on, on the question of, uh, was doing nuclear simulation exercises. And it was, I guess it was Pickering, it was in this exercise. And they were supposed to play along, give us input, give us some real data, help us simulate an outbreak and how we would deal with that. <laughs> well, these bastards wouldn't even uh, release fake data. They wouldn't release anything. This was an exercise. It was internal. The media wasn't there, nothing. They they still wouldn't take that risk um, of, of, of even cooperating. So... Um, in, in the lack of transparency, I mean, it's just the opposite of community engagement. Uh, and I agree with what Gary said. Uh, that's part of moving forward on this is breaking that down. Community engagement, like you were mentioning, Angela, in Germany. I, I hadn't, wasn't aware of that, but that sounds sounds like that would be extremely important. Um, so anyways, that's I think that's pretty much all I had to say. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Tom. Um, Betty Jane, are you there to ask your question? I hope she's okay. Yeah, I hope so. Okay, so I think not. Can I, so, can I chime in? <laughs> okay, just for one minute, though, because we're already over time. No, I just want to point out, I never got a question, an answer on my question about the potential of geological hydrogen or hydrogen period, clean hydrogen. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Angela for one minute to, for if so hydrogen I, I don't really you're the engineer Hans so this is very this so just parrot what I understand uh that hydrogen is essentially a way of storing energy and we still have to create that hydrogen and um we like very small percentage of, uh, percentage of hydrogen is produced with renewable power. We would support hydrogen if it was produced with renewable power. I think 2% of hydrogen today is produced with renewable power. Most of it is produced with fossil power gas. And so 
when the industry really pumps hydrogen, they're pumping fossil hydrogen because that's mostly how it's being produced. I don't know the kind of hydrogen that you're talking about, the geological hydrogen. I know nothing about that. I know the hyperon hydrogen, though, is mostly fossil hydrogen. And it's a it's a way for it for industry to, you know, keep burning gas. And if we would only support it if it was green and if it was uh, used and and it will be very precious and we'll need to use that green hydrogen for like long haul transport and other very important uh, ways that can't get that batteries wouldn't work like batteries wouldn't work for airplanes for example but uh but hydrogen green hydrogen could work for airplanes or trucking does that make sense yeah i acknowledge that this this geological hydrogen is a, a recent discovery and uh, i know very little about it except that it hit the news uh, late last year Okay, and that thanks. it pertains it pertains to Ontario. We we, okay, we have a you, potential Hans. of having it. I'm going to look into that, Hans. Okay, thank you, Hans, for bringing bringing that up. That that can be maybe a whole new uh, whole new no, I won't a whole new forum. I'm not even going to go to Tom unless he insists. I he has something to add to that. No, no. you don't. Okay, because we are over time, and it's a web a webcast that usually just you know we do it for. Uh, 90 minutes. But anyway, uh, if you agree, folks, with what you heard during this program and you're not a member of Socialist Action, please join. Just sign up at our website, www.socialistaction.ca, or call 647 98 61917. Easy to remember, 1917 was the year of the Russian Revolution. So thanks very, very much, Angela and Tom. And this was a, a, a great, a great webinar. And of course, a, a special thanks to Kiri, our uh, technical producer, and our Barry, uh, who is our political producer for, at the series of webcasts. So please consider being a supporter of Socialist Action News Reports and the SA Monthly Magazine, The Red Review, which we will send to you online. To fill out the form, just visit our website, www.socialistaction.com. Dot ca, or if you would like to talk to us, write Socialist Action Canada at gmail.com. This show has been recorded and can be seen on the Socialist Action YouTube channel. The next essay webcast on Thursday will be Thursday, March 14th, and is titled Does Ottawa Back the Zionist State and Genocide? It will feature speakers Shatha. Mahmoud of the Palestine Youth Movement, Eve Engler of the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute, and Tamara Lawrence of the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace. That is taking place on Thursday, March the 14th, starting at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. And the Zoom link will be posted on the SA website. And looking further down the road, a very interesting topic is titled The Greatest Propaganda Lies which speaks, uh, speakers Flo Sherrod, Hans Modlik, uh, Barry Wiseletter, and others to be announced. So, comrades, thanks again. In the meantime, please be safe, stay healthy, and stay active. Bye for now.